Hello, people online. Hi, everyone. Good morning! Oh, it's always good to get that good blah going in the morning, right? All right. We're going to have you guys stand up as we sing this first song. All right, stand up and look at your neighbor, whether you know him or not. Say good morning. Good morning, good morning. Now look at him and say, I am counting on God. Woo! Fight not physical I'm in a war but not with this world You are the life that's beautiful I want more I want all that is yours Five, six, seven, eight Joy unspeakable that won't go away Just enough strength to live for today So I never have to worry what tomorrow will bring My faith is on the solid rock I'm counting on God I'm counting on, 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 I'm counting on God What do you think? Yeah? I agree! I'm in a fight, not physical I'm in a war, but not with this world You are the light that's beautiful I want more I want all that is yours Five, six, seven, eight Joy unspeakable that won't go away Just enough strength to live for the day So I never have to worry what tomorrow will bring Cause my faith is on the solid rock I'm counting on God I'm counting on, 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 I'm counting on God It's a miracle of Christ in me is the mystery that sets me free I'm nothing like I used to be Just open up your eyes You'll see Joy unspeakable that won't go away Just enough strength to live for the day So I never have to worry what tomorrow will bring Cause my faith is on the solid rock I'm counting on God I'm counting on, I'm counting on God I'm counting on, I'm counting on God I'm counting on, I'm counting on God. 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 Everybody have a seat. <laughs> Woo! All right. We have a broken pop machine. But we have a new one coming this week. We have one coming for here and for the Grove. So if you want it, you can have it. But you got to move it. It's broken, but... People make different things out of them. They make them into storage cabinets. They make them into gun safes. They make them into all sorts of things. So if that is your desire, it's yours. Come see me. What? Well, there you go. It could be a makeshift coffin. I, hey, you know, if you want to go that route, um, all vault in one. Um, so if you want it, let me know. But... You have to figure out how to get it out of here. So, because the new one's coming this week, and so that one has got to go. All right. Chosen, 
Episode three, season four, tonight at the Grove, 29th and J. Please come join us there. Um, this is the new season that's come out. It was in the theaters. It has not yet been shown on any streaming service. It's released to churches right now, and we got the rights to show this thing. So tonight, episode three of season four. Come join us. Six o'clock at the Grove. Thursday night, seven o'clock will be episode four. So we're moving forward, see? Okay, so there you go. Tonight, episode three. Tomorrow night, April 8th, um, the ladies' new study preview, Unshakable Moxie, will be going on. So if you're interested in a ladies' Bible study, um, tomorrow night at the Grove, 29th and J, 7 o'clock, come join them for this new study that they are getting ready to do. Also, men's Bible studies at 7 o'clock at the Grove tomorrow night, too. Um, Broken and Beautiful Women's Conference is coming up April 27th, 2024, this year, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., $25 registration. It's going to be held at the First Church of the Nazarene. Do not let the $25 registration fee keep you from going to this conference. Ladies, you need to go to this. We have scholarships available. We have people that are said they will help pay for people if they need to go. Do not let finances keep you from going and hearing this conference and the speaker and the things that they have to say. So please, ladies, Broken to Beautiful Conference, April 27th. Mark it on your calendar. Art. 29th. It's Saturday. Because last week I had 29, but then it was 20. It's wrong. <laughs> Which it is does. it, Bruce? Saturday's the 27th. The flyer's wrong. Dun, 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 dun. dun. Congratulations. If you noticed it said the 29th, you win the prize. Yeah. You get to come lead the next song. <laughs> um, <laughs> Summer camp. Camp of the Good Shepherd, Louisville, Nebraska. Sign up is now available. So you can sign up online or there will be paper forms coming up here on the baptistry back there. Um, again, it's going to be everything has to be in by May 19th. Um, it is camp for all ages of kids up through 12th grade, um, and there are scholarships available. Again, the, one of the things that we really want to stress is don't let finances keep you from going to these great programs. We will figure out a way. So please, please, kids, if you want to go, we can take care of the financial side of it. Absolutely. But please sign up for camp this summer. It's going to be awesome. And I heard that the dean of the high school camp, quite a guy. And I hear he's going to have a band with him. So anyway, high school camp, kids, think about it. It's going to be good. <laughs> All right. A um, couple dates to save. All Church Creighton baseball game, Friday, May 17th. We have 300 tickets in hand. Please invite your friends, your family, your coworkers, whoever you want to invite. Have them come to the Creighton game. It is a great time every year. Um, and so we will pack a whole section of the stadium over there and just have a great time watching baseball. So if you are interested, we've got tickets. Tickets and if you are free. Free. For us. They're free. And if we yeah. run out of tickets, they'll give us more. Yeah. And if you don't believe that, go over and look at that stadium. That's a lot of seats. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. all right. So uh, Creighton baseball game, Friday, May 17th. We are so grateful to Creighton that we can get those tickets each year, and we love having that night out as a church. And then also mark on your calendar, May 19th, that Sunday, um, is the bike blessing here at the church. Woohoo! Woo so mark that on your calendar as well. Come that Sunday morning. We'll be giving you more details as we get closer. But plans are, weather holds, we'll be doing everything outside again, the service and everything. So um, get them bikes shined up. May 19th will be coming soon. All right. That's it. All right, let's have everybody stand up again. Well, I've been turned round, but I've never been lost. Seen the water get troubled, but we walked across. When my knees were shaking, you held my hand, turning all my problems to a promised land. 
Lead on, good shepherd, I'll follow all my days. There ain't nothing sweeter than to watch you make a way. You walk me through the valley, but you never steer me wrong. So lead on, good shepherd, lead on. Seen mighty deep canyons, you brought me through. Seen mighty big mountains, just up and move. Glory, glory, hallelujah, yeah, that's my song. I'm walking with my Father to the great unknown. Lead on, good shepherd, I'll follow all my days. There ain't nothing sweeter than to watch you make a way. You walk me through the valley, but you never steer me wrong. So lead on, good shepherd, lead on. Step by step, day by day, lead me on, Lord, I pray. Road gets dark, walk by faith. Lead on, good shepherd. Step by step, day by day, lead me on, Lord, I pray. Road gets dark, walk by faith. Lead on, good shepherd. Lead on, good shepherd, I'll follow all my days. There ain't nothing sweeter than to watch you make the way. You walk me through the valley, but you never steer me wrong. So lead on, good shepherd, lead on. So lead on, good shepherd, I'll follow all my days. There ain't nothing sweeter than to watch you make a way. You walk me through the valley, but you never steer me wrong. So lead on, good shepherd, lead on. So lead on, good shepherd, lead on. So lead on, good shepherd, lead on. Salvation's waiting. You built a mighty fortress, ten thousand burdens high. Love is here to lift you up, here to lift you high. If you're lost and wandering, come stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the walls start crumbling, let the gates of glory open wide. Anybody feel like you stumbled this week? All who strayed and walked away, speak of all things you've done. Fix your eyes on the mountain, let the past be dead and gone. Come all saints and sinners, you can't outrun God. Whatever you've done can't overcome the power of the blood. If you're lost and wandering, come stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the walls start. From the land, let the gates of glory open wide. If you're lost and wrecked again, come stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the walls start from the land, let the gates of glory open wide. Lift your head, we're so high. The river's just a down the path of forgiveness, salvation's waiting there. You built a mighty fortress, ten thousand burdens high. Love is here to lift you up, here to lift you high. If you're lost and wandering, come stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the walls start crumbling, let the gates of glory open wide. If you're lost and Wrecked again, come stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the walls start from a land that the gates of glory open wide. Let the gates of glory open wide. Let the gates of glory open wide. 
Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you so much for your presence here today. We thank you for living and breathing and giving us life. We thank you for your mercy and for your kindness when we just stumble all over the place. Thank you for giving us a place that we can just come running straight to you. God, you love us more than we can imagine. Open our ears and open our hearts today and help us to understand how you want us to live, what you want us to do, and help us talk to you more openly. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. morning. It's time for communion. You know, we all have people in our lives that we love, people that we love unconditionally, that they, uh, you know, they they might do us wrong, but we still love them. We still take care of them as much as we can. Um, Do you have someone in your life that you die for because you love them so much? (laughs) Do you have someone in your life that you would know they would keep continually mess up and continue to irritate you and you'd still die for it. Because Christ knew all that about every single one of us when he went to that cross. He knew that we would never get it right, that we were a broken people, and that we just wouldn't, we needed him. He had to do that or we would never get it right. We'd never make it. We'd never know the narrow gate to get there. Christ is that. This is our time to remember what he has done for us, that time that he saved us over and over and over and over again in our life, and we'll continue until we meet him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this family to come together and and just remember what your son has done for each and every single one of us. Uh, I ask that you just put in front of each person here that no matter how many times that they mess up, no matter how many times they fail, that you still love them, that you will still love them tomorrow, the next day. And you have never stopped loving them any minute of their life. No matter how bad or great they were, you have loved them every second. Father, we just ask that you be in this room. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Together, let's take the bread that represents his body that was broke for each and one, every one of us. And the juice that represents his blood poured out for our sins.
Good morning, everybody. It's time for offering. Uh, this morning for offering, I wanted to read from the, the 23rd chapter of Leviticus. This is what it says. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. So even when God was establishing his nation, he told him, he said, work and go and do. And then don't harvest at all. You need to leave a little bit so that I can do some work. Right? And that's what we have to realize is we still have been given great gifts and we can use them, but we got to leave some room for God to work in them. That's what our offering does. Everything we have, we've been given by the Lord. And he says, you know what? I want to use some of that and I want to use you. And it's not just your money, it's your talent, your time, and your treasures. Everything you have is a gift from God. And what I think we don't realize sometimes is, is, is where does that need to go? And there's one answer, and that's, that's to God's people. Because I'm pretty sure the biggest thing God cares about is his creation. And if your time and your talent and your treasures aren't going to his creation to help his people, I, I don't think he's excited about where your stuff's going then. Right? Because that's the only thing eternal. And that's the impact we're trying to have, right? Is an eternal one with all we do. This offering does that. It allows us to give and to glorify God and to further his kingdom. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Would you all please pray with me? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, Lord, thank you so much, Father, for giving us so very much. Uh, Father, we know that all we have, we have because of you. And Father, as we, as we collect this offering, and, and Lord, we know it's, it's more than just the money. We know there, you've given us our, our time and our talents as well. And so, Father, we just ask that right now, whatever we're supposed to be using all of our gifts for, let us do that. And Father, we know it's, it's, it's for your people. And so, Father, what we also ask right now is, 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 Father, whatever's breaking your heart, allow it to break ours. Allow us to feel that pain so that we can we can focus all we have onto the things that are important to you, not us. Not us at all, Father, because we have the security of resting in the fact that you gave your son for us. And that he died so that we can one day be with you forever. And now we're just asked to give back just a little. And Father, it's, it seems like such an easy, easy thing to do. And Lord, we just need you to work on our hearts and help us do that very thing right now. Because we love you. And we are so grateful that you loved us so much that you gave up your son to die for us so we could have that, that eternity with you. Father, bless this gift. Bless every giver and allow it to glorify you in all that we do. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Run, run. Children are dismissed for Children's Church. And if you're in middle school or high school, you are dismissed to go upstairs.
And we are going to pick back up in the book of Luke, uh, Luke chapter 16 this week before Easter and Palm Sunday. Um, we finished with 15, and 15 ended with the story of the prodigal son. Um, so we're going to go into Luke chapter 16 this week. And I want to read this to you and just kind of get your initial reaction with this. It says, Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job, and I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I, I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors, and he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? Nine hundred gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. So, Jesus just told this guy, good job for acting dishonestly. Good job for ripping these people off and ripping your manager off. Keep it up. Right? Well, that's what some people have taken with this. They look at it and go, what in the heck is that? Why was that even be included in Scripture? It seems contradictory to what Jesus says so many other times. And I want to tell you it's perception. It's, it's how we perceive what we are looking at because we're looking at it at a face value even though it's a it's a story it's a parable that jesus is telling and we're looking at it and on the surface we look at it and go he just said good job for being this shrewd dishonest person but put it into the context of what jesus is saying in his teaching he's speaking to his disciples but he's talking about the pharisees and so he's pointing their attention to the Pharisees. Now, let's back up. Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager um, was accused of wasting his possessions. Now, when we look at it from face value, we just read it out of context. We read that little section of Scripture. We go, that's really not consistent with Scripture. But if we look at it as Jesus warning his disciples... This is what the Pharisees are doing. This is what I'm seeing in the world. He says, So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job, and I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors and then asked the first, How much do you owe my master? And he, 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. And the manager told him, Take your bill, sit down and quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. And he told him, Take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. And so Jesus is saying, from a human worldly perspective, he did exactly what he probably should have done. You see, at the end of his job here, at the end of his career, he tried to make amends with the people that he had offended and he had taken advantage of and that he had hurt through his life and he knew that his job was coming to an end and so he tried to make amends with them so that when his job was over he would have a place to turn and ask for help. He would have a place to go and stay if he needed and he would have a place that he could go get a meal if he needed it because even though he was dishonest to his master he was trying to show the people, hey, I'm here for you. And so I'm going to cut your bill. I'm going to cut you a break. Maybe you can return the favor someday. And Jesus said, 
That's exactly the way the world functions. Is we wait till the end and then we try to make amends. We try to make it up. Maybe you've been in this situation. Maybe you know somebody who's been in this situation. Maybe it's somebody that you've known that knew that they were getting to the end of their life and the thing that they wanted to do was make amends with as many people as they could so that they could rest a little easier. Or maybe win some favor with God or win some favor with the people of this world so it would work out for them. And it says, I tell you, Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you will be welcome into eternal dwellings. It says, take the things that you have, use them to make friends on this earth, but think about the eternity of it too. Not just the things of this world. Not just the rewards of this world, but the eternal things with it. So take the possessions and the wealth that you have, take the things that you have, and use them to influence people, but for God rather than for man. Take yourself out of that position. Oh, that way I'll have a place to stay, and maybe put it into something where you can say, hey, let me show you Christ so that it's building up eternal returns with that. And then it goes on and it says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? Now again, he's talking about the Pharisees here. How can God trust them with the true riches of the kingdom of God, the truth of eternity, when they couldn't even handle the things of this world? So they're more worried about their own position and their own wealth and their own standing and their own everything else. But where were they with God? And he says, how can we trust them with the truth when they couldn't even take care of the law? (laughs) And if you have not been trustworthy in someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. (coughs) You cannot serve both God and money. You can't do it. You're going to love the one and hate the other. And what he means by that is you're going to be devoted to that one and you're not going to be as devoted to the other. You're not going to build that same love with it. Now, does he say here that if you really want to be godly, you cannot have any money? That's not what he said. It's the love of that wealth. It's the love of the money. It's the making that money your God or your main thing or your pursuit or putting it above the other things of life is where it becomes sin. But instead, we should take the things that God has blessed us with, whether it be material wealth or whatever, and use that for God's kingdom. And that's what Jesus is pointing out to his disciples here, is don't be like the Pharisees who have acquired all this wealth for themselves and have tried to do these things to make people happy with them and look like they're righteous and look like they're holy, but God knows their hearts. And their true love is money. And if we can't even trust them to get the law right without distorting it for their own personal gain, how in the world are they going to handle the truth of who Jesus is as the Messiah and the one who came to save them? He says, so you can't look to them because they've already made their mind up. And I'm going to tell you something that I have shared in a Bible study many years ago, and I've shared it in some other ones since then. And sometimes it it, it offends people a little bit. Sometimes it challenges people a little bit. And it's a real simple little statement. And I think about it for myself many times. And that is, when you are at the bottom, and I don't care what bottom that is, sometimes people think that you have to be like, you know, 
laying there with absolutely nothing before you hit the bottom. No, the bottom of you can come at many different places in your life. And when you are at that place where you are challenged and you do not have the answer, what do you turn to? That is your God. When you are challenged with things of this world and the first reaction that you have is, how can I buy my way out of this? Money is probably pretty high on your list. You put your faith and your trust in what that money can do for you. And so you think, oh, I'm fine here because I've got this cushion, this backup plan, and I can pay for anything and I can buy my way out of this. Okay. You have a terrible health problem and there is no cure. Buy your way out. You can't. But we so many times put our faith in what we have and what we can do. And then we go to God, not go to Him first. It may be alcohol, it may be drugs, it may be whatever. When you come to that place in your life where you don't have that answer, what you turn to is what you are serving. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't come back to God later, but it does mean that's your first reaction, and we need to work on our walk with Christ so that our first reaction should be to look to Him and say, God, how can I use the things that you have given me? Wealth, relationships, whatever. For this. But God, you, di- you direct my steps, not me. Lord, you tell me what's next. What do we put our faith and trust in? And that's what Jesus is talking to his disciples about. You have Pharisees that looked so righteous, but their heart was not right at all with God because their trust was in their position and their wealth, not in their relationship with God. And Jesus said it's perception. Many things in our life are based on perception. It's the way we see them, the way we take them, and the way we process that information. One of the things that I want to address here um, today, and, and this is one of those things that last hour was really interesting because some people said, I had never thought of that. And other people were like, I've been wondering about that. So here it is. Are you ready? Brace yourselves. Perception. That skull. I've received a couple emails, a couple phone calls, a few questions. I was hoping I'd get a few more questions from the people in the audience, but I got a few people. Why do you have something that is evil on the drums during service? Why do you have an occult symbol in your sanctuary? Why do you hate people so bad? Because apparently that's a symbol of hate. So why are you that evil in your service? Perception. Okay? Originally when I saw that skull... I'll be totally honest with you. I thought it kind of looked like Jake. <laughs> now you won't be able to unsee it. <laughs> but I want you to understand why it's there and what it means. And again, I understand the perception. Some people have been offended by the fact that it's there. Um, people online even wonder because they see it and they go, why in the heck would they have that there? But it's, it's, again, it's how we view it. You can see it as something evil and tell yourself that's evil, and so therefore I have a problem with this, and I can't be a part of this. And, and I hope that's not the case. But there have been some people that were offended by that, and I've talked to them. Hopefully, if you were offended, you came to talk to me and not just walked away, um, because that's, that's what it's for. But I want to read something for you, and then I want to talk to you a little bit about the perception of that. And I want to go to Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ... And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay. The skull is actually one of the earliest symbols of the church. 
It is not a recent adaptation to it. The world kind of took it from the church and, and said this is what it's going to mean now. But the skull is actually an early symbol of the church. It actually predates the cross in many situations. Um, the reason for that is because during the Roman Empire, the cross was still an instrument of torture and death. It wasn't something that you wore on a gold chain and went, oh, look at my beautiful cross. It'd be like us walking around with an electric chair hanging from our <laughs> neck. Going, oh, isn't it beautiful? Um, now, we have made it the Christian symbol, and the cross is what people recognize with it. But the skull was actually an early symbol for Christianity. And what it represents is death to self. Okay? Now, along with it, there's this Latin little phrase that you need to learn. You ready? Momentum mori. Momentum mori means remember you will die. It was also represented with the skull usually, and we don't have that up here with it, but that would be something that would, they would show a skull and they would have momentum more. I remember you will die. It is a reminder for you to remember that your days on this earth are numbered. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that these earthly tents that we live in, if these earthly tents are destroyed, we have an eternal house in heaven not built by human hands, but built by God himself. And so we will wait for that day to receive our eternal home, but we have to remember every day that these bodies that we are in are but tents. They are meant to be temporary. And if the Lord does not return soon, each one of us will someday die. This is another one of those uplifting sermons. <laughs> Y'all destined to be dust. But just the tent, not us, we are destined to live forever in the presence of the Lord himself. And so when you see this skull, I don't want you to be offended. We're not doing weird things here on Saturday night or anything like that, lighting candles and dancing around, whatever. That's not what it's about. What it's about is when you see it, change your perception. And when you look at that and when you see a skull, remember that you too shall die. Momentum mori that life is short, and you need to, like that shrewd manager, make the most of your moments. Not in a wicked and deceptive way, but in a way that is eternal and lasting in Christ. And so when I see that skull, um, I don't think of it as evil. I, I don't think of it as evil. It reminds me that I'm mortal, and that I have died to myself. My, I have given up myself to live for Christ. That represents the old. That represents the temporary. That represents the things that will pass away. But it reminds me that I too will die. And I want to make the most of my life every minute that I have left to live. Uh, carpe diem. Seize the day. Because you know what? You may think like that shrewd, shrewd manager, I've got time to make amends with the people that I've offended. I've got time to make amends with the people of my family that I've walked away from or my friends that I've walked away from. But we don't know if we have tomorrow. We don't know if we have the rest of today. If you listen to the internet, it's all over tomorrow. <laughs> See y'all Tuesday. Um, <laughs> I, I, well, I won't go into that. Um, <laughs> See me after. Um, but I do want you to remember that we need to make the most of every day. And if by looking at this little skull, again, I am not trying to offend. And honestly... Here, here's where I stand. If it truly offends people, I will take it down. I do not have some twisted little thing that I'm going to stand on principle and say that skull has to be there. Uh, that's, that's not what it's about. So if it truly offends, uh, come talk to me. We'll see what we can work out. But when you look at it, I don't want you to think, why would that be there? But instead, look at it and realize the big symbol behind it, the cross, is what it's about. That's the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. But because he gave his life and he rose again, and he's seated at the throne of God, we must die to ourself. And remember that we are that little temporary. 
We are that little tent that will pass away. Momento mori. You too will die. Make the most of every day that you have. Tell the world about Christ. I'm going to have the guys come forward. Oh, Todd right there. Almost built a book past you. And you choose the song. So now we get a little glimpse at Todd here. He gets to pick the closing song from the ones we did earlier. We'll see which, you know. This is Todd's playlist right now. Okay, that's all the way. Oh, let me go back here. We'll get you set up. Oh, no, you're fine. Um, lift your head. Yep. All right. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer, and then we will sing our closing song. Um, there's our singer. We're good. Okay. <laughs> Let's pray. Dearly Father, we come to you and we thank you for this day that we could come into your house, that we could sing our praises to you, that we could lift our voices to you, uh, but most importantly, Lord, that we can worship you, that we can come, we can uh, just fall at your feet and proclaim that you are God. Lord, remember, our, Lord, let us, let us remember, help us to remember that, that we are mortal, that we are on this earth for a temporary amount of time, but yet that's not the end. It just reminds us that we have so few days to spread your word and to spread your message, but that someday we will spend eternity with you. And so, Lord, we do remember that we are here dead to ourselves, but living for you. Lord, I pray that you would be with us. Watch over us, keep us, bring us back together as we come to worship you next week, Lord. Uh, we come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just like home. I said, yeah, go ahead, Todd. It. Pick whatever song you want. And then she's like, nope, not that nope. one. <laughs> you can pick whatever song you want as long as it's that one. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.